Hello and welcome to the Important Conversations event series brought to you by the Johns Hopkins University Master of Arts in Communication and the Office of Advanced Academic Programs Committee on Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. Today's event features Dr. Tristan Cabello presenting a short history of the French Black Lives Matter movement. My name is Peter Huggins and I'm the event producer. Please note today's program will be recorded and uploaded to the AAP YouTube channel under the Important Conversations Equity, Diversity, Inclusion playlist. During the program, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function and we'll answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A portion of the event. With that, I'll turn over the event to the host of our program, Dr. Patricia Hernandez. Hello. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. I'm Patricia Hernandez. I'm the program coordinator of the MA in Communication program, also the co-chair of the DEI committee. And I'm thrilled to have you all join us and also thrilled to uh, be a part of this series that it's so important to the work that we've been doing in DEI here at AAP. And also couldn't be happier to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Tristan Cabello a uh, good friend and also an incredible colleague uh, who hails from Northwestern uh, University as with his PhD and also a French native. So of course, very relevant to the topic we're talking about today. And he's not gonna talk about the elections, but we know that's also relevant as well. And I also just wanted to mention, I uh, appreciate if you are joining this and you sent an email about wanting to be a part of the student focus group for the um, DEI uh, student focus group. We will be in touch shortly. So if you sent me an email, I promise to be in touch with you uh, shortly. So with no further ado, uh, Tristan, welcome. And thank you so much for being willing to be a part of this series. Thank you so much, Trisha. So it's uh, really a pleasure to be here uh, today and, uh, and also a pleasure to work with you uh, on the DI committee, of course. So uh, this project on Black Lives Matter uh, was very much a pandemic project for me. Uh, it really started out uh, at uh, the beginning, but just before the pandemic, when we used to do uh, those type of uh, discussions um, in person. And Peter, if you can start the, the PowerPoint now. Thank you so much. Uh, first slide. Next slide. And it started out at a, uh, an interview that I did uh, back in December 2019, when we used to do those type of things in, in public. And I interviewed one of um, uh, an upcoming, uh, up and coming French writer uh, in uh, Washington, D.C., in one of the bookstores in Washington, D.C. And one of the questions, his name is Edouard Louis, and one of the questions that uh, people asked at the end of the show uh, during the Q&A was, um, who do you think represents now uh, the working class um, in, in, in France? And Edouard Louis politically, and Edouard Louis answered, um, I think it's the Adama Committee. And I had heard of the Adama Committee, but the Adama Committee for me was not really a political organization. It was just really, um, it was really an anti-racist organization, a grassroots anti-racist organization, but not a political party. And so I started doing research on the Adama Committee, and I find out a lot of very interesting things uh, about what they do in France about anti-racism. Next slide. Fast forward a few months later, uh, the world shuts down, as everybody remembers. And in um, uh, May, uh, George Floyd uh, is murdered by the police in uh, Minneapolis. And so French journalists start to call me uh, to do interviews and to try to explain what has happened uh, here in the US. Uh, and I've always done this type of transcultural uh, conversations and uh, explanation for the general pu public. But this time, um, I was bothered by one question that constantly came back. And it was, why is this flight, why is this fight important to, fr important to France? Because clearly, uh, what journalists thought was that uh, the situation was much better in France, that racism did not exist in France, and that obviously uh, that was an importation. This fight was an importation from um, the US. Um, and so here, that was truly uh, a lack of knowledge about uh, the situation for uh, Black and brown people um, in, in France. Uh, next slide. 
And finally, um, right at the end of the pandemic in uh, 2021, early 2021, I think, um, I did this conversation with Pap and Diaye at the Alliance Francaise in DC. And um, the Alliance Francaise, the Pap and Diaye is one of the founders of Black Studies in France. And it's somebody who has studied very much a lot in, um, in, in the US um, and who brought back to France with him uh, the concept of critical race theory, of African-American studies, of black studies. Um, and Pap and Diaye said something that was very uh, forceful to me and very enlightening. He said that um, one of the things that he has done uh, in France was not about importing what he had learned in the United States, it was about re-entering with his own identity and with a new theoretical uh, framework. And so that was very powerful. And here I had really uh, the three ingredients of this research, that is to say, the invisibility of the anti-racism fight in France on the one hand, the reshaping of the working class politics, and also the circulation of ideas. Next slide. And then uh, just earlier, uh, this um, just earlier this year, late February, uh, I went to a conference in uh, Nantes. Um, it's a literary conference um, that uh, presents, you know, all the work that has been uh, done on uh, post-colonial um, literature and history. And one of the topics that came back often at this conference was very interesting. It was um, the fact that uh, there was a documentary that had been broadcast um, in uh, France on France 2, um, the public the public network. It was called uh, Noir en France, uh, Blacks in France. Um, and it was a documentary uh, that was, of course, you know, published, um, uh, broadcast in the middle of the presidential election campaign in which the far right was expected to garner nearly 30% of the vote. The film was narrated by, uh, next slide, by French uh, Congolese uh, writer Alain Mabancou and uh, directed by journalist Aurélia Perrault. And what's very interesting about this movie, about this documentary, when you read the reviews, is that um, the reviews said that the, re the reviews were saying that it was a very high quality work because Blacks in France were not portrayed as victims. And indeed, the documentary was not a uh, victimaire, as we say uh, in France, documentary. It was a collection of individuals, um, uh, individual stories of people who had overcome racism in their daily lives, but it was not about uh, racism as a system. Racism as a system was never discussed. The movie entirely forgets about France's colonial history, the police brutality that black communities encounter in France, um, or uh, the history of discrimination. And since the documentary did not talk about victims, it also did not mention oppressors. Uh, it's as if uh, the white spectator could not be hurt, um, uh, as if uh, racism as a system did not exist in France. The documentary also, uh, did describe the global outrage that erupted after the death of George Floyd, but it never talked about police violence in France. And perhaps the most disturbing aspect of the movie was that the most prominent, the most famous, the most radical anti-racist political activist of our time in France is never talked about and is never discussed. Next slide. Her name is, uh, uh, next slide again. <laughs> Her name is Asa Traoré. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I have three parts here. The first part is about the, the Francis, Francis anti-racist movement, um, uh, the Comité Adama. Uh, next slide. On May 31st, uh, 2019, Assa Traoré had organized a demonstration following the death of George Floyd. The demonstration, which was first banned in France because it exceeded the 10,000 person limit fixed by COVID regulations, was actually a huge success. To everybody's surprise, both Traoré and the government, it was estimated that more than 80,000 people showed up. Many protesters held signs that said, for the very first time in France, Black Lives Matter, no vie, les vies noires comptent, and also, I can breathe, uh, echoing uh, George Floyd's final words. But it also echoed the final words of Adama Traoré, 
Assas brothers. Since 2016, Assa Traoré has been investigating the conditions surrounding her brother's death at the police station of Persan, 40 miles north of Paris. Traoré died of, quote, a very serious infection uh, affecting several organs, the prosecutor said initially. A second autopsy, though, ordered by the family ruled out the infection. And since then, the state has issued endless reports, which the family has countered. The examining magistrate closed the investigation in March 2020 without charging the officers. And Traoré's family released another medical report blame, blaming asphyxia caused by restraint for his, days, for his death. And it was for this reason um, that Assa Traoré, uh, that you see here, uh, has created the committee, um, the committee for Adama, Adama's committee, a political group fighting police brutality and systemic racism in France. Um, next slide. So that's a couple of pictures of uh, uh, the protest there. Next slide. That's uh, the poster for Adama's um, Adama Traoré's uh, march. Next slide. Uh, what's very interesting to, um, what's very important to underline here is the fact that um, stopping a person for no reason uh, in the streets uh, by the police, the police can stop any person for any reason in the streets uh, in France, uh, just for an identity check. And so uh, black and brown people are heavily discriminated this way. Uh, and this is why there is really uh, a lot of uh, discrimination and police brutality in, in, in France. And François Hollande, the former president, um, had decided to stop this law, that nobody could be stopped for any reason uh, in the streets of France uh, anymore. But uh, due to the terrorist attacks uh, that happened in 2019, um, this, um, this never happened. Next slide. So Assa Traoré, uh, uh, first, Assa Traoré wanted to build a movement that spoke to France's young Black and Arab citizens. Contrary to the anti-racist movement, next slide, SOS racism, uh, next slide again, SOS racism slogan, who spoke on their behalf. I mean, if you remember the slogan, which was incredibly patronizing back in the days, uh, touche ma rompa, à mon pas, don't touch my friend. Um, SOS racism was, however, completely linked in uh, very important ways to the Socialist Party. The Comité Adama is trying to reinvent a form of grassroots grassroot left here. Next slide. Its iconography is revolutionary. Traoré, a fan of Angela Davis, is often pictured raising a fist. She rejected the archetype of the grieving relative early on, preferring to face the public as a soldier le leading a war machine. She often calls the movement Génération Adama, a collective effort to save society. But when the movement started, Interior Minister uh, Christen, uh, Christophe Castaner, pictured here, argued, quote, I want to remind everyone that France is not the USA. And also the history of the Traoré's family is a typical French history. Uh, they were denying their fight as an import, as an American import. And actually, this is not unusual for France. Uh, American racism is often used in France to avoid the question of systemic, systemic inequalities in the country. In a recent cartoon that I don't have here, um, published by Le Monde, uh, you could see a white French man absorbed in a newspaper article about police brutality in America. And that same man misses the police beating of a black man right next to him. Slavery, segregation, and mass incarceration are frequently cited by intellectuals while ignoring that the same abuses exist in France. They often argue that American style identity politics undermines the Republican ideal. A French citizen is first a French citizen nothing more, nothing less. That explains why Traoré herself is often very reluctant to use the word racism. Uh, and until recently, she didn't use it. She still said to this day that she doesn't like the term also white privilege. Next slide. Recent events have accelerated the recognition of police brutality in France, though. First, uh, there is the Gilets Jaunes, uh, the Yellow Vest protest, has exposed a large number of white working class French to police violence. Second, the country was on lockdown for two months. Next slide. 
giving the entire population a test of a taste of police control. But people in uh, Saint Saint-Denis, for example, the northern suburbs of Paris, which is uh, predominantly black and predominantly working class, um, one of the uh, so these the people who live there were fined three times the national average during lockdown. But what was surprising to me was that at first the government seemed to care. In an opinion piece published by Le Monde, the government's uh, the government's uh, spokesperson Sibet Ndiaye gently challenged the universalist orthodoxy that underpins the national prohibition on compiling statistics on race, ethnicity, and religion. It's strictly forbidden in France to compile those type of statistics even in the workplace. She wrote that to keep universalism alive, quote, we must name things, say that a skin color is not neutral, that a last name or a first name can be stigmatizing. The next slide, Emmanuel Macron, the president, urge the interior minister, minister to speed up a set of police reform, police recommendation. And on June 8th, for example, uh, the police announced that they would stop using chuckles. Traoré at the time was preparing for a round of TV appearances ahead of the 2nd March, which happened on June 13th, a mobilisation nationale and national mobilisation plan uh, at the Place de la République in Paris. She had given a press conference in front of a new mural right here, uh, featuring her brother and George Floyd. Shortly after, Omar Sy, next slide, one of um, France's uh, favorite celebrity, favorite actor, uh, gave an interview in Lops saying that police violence is everybody's affair. The next day on Quotidien, next slide, uh, one of uh, the sh one of the most popular show uh, in France, Christian Taubira, former Minister of Justice, appeared with Traoré, and she said, and she told her, "quote You are a chance for France." And after the second demonstration, however, the tone of the government the tone of the government starting to change. Next slide. President Macron addressed the nation addressed the nation the next day. He seemed more concerned with fending off with the far right. Uh, he promised that France statues would stand and that he would stand by the police, some of whom had spent the week counter-protesting by hurling their handcuffs on the ground in various cities. Macron never said it, nor did he mention the name of George Floyd, the name of Adama Traoré, or any other police brutality victim. Traoré went on TV that night and told him, quote, you are the youngest president France ever had. You promised us a new world. But on June 2nd, the young people of France went out and said they had enough. We'll make sure that things will change. Next slide. And what Macron did that night was much more problematic. Uh, he was denying a history of racism in France. And by Americanizing Traoré's fight, denying by the same token, uh, the history of anti-racism in France. Next slide. Traoré is far from being the first anti-racist activist in France. Anti-racist organizations um, have a long history. There was a Black People's League in France in the early 20th century, which had ties with American leaders. Du Bois spent time in Paris in 1919. Marcus Garvey was well known and translated in Paris very early on. Kojo Tovalu, right here, a French African activist, went to New York for the United Negro Improvement Association's annual meeting early in the century. There was no central organization like the NWACP in France, but a few organizations did survive for a few years or longer throughout the 20th century. Parallel to this history, a uh, next quote, France had, uh, next, uh, next slide, France had many intellectuals who reflected on racial issues. Think of the Negritude movement, for example, with uh, poet Leopold Sendar Sanger and uh, Aimé Césaire uh, in the 30s. Think about the Paris-based Présence African journal. Next quote, next slide. Uh, first published in 1947, uh, in which several notable intellectuals, including Franz Fanon, published. Uh, think of the famous 1956 Black intellectuals at the Congress of uh, the Sorbonne University which had a deep echo and a deep uh, impact in France with, uh, with American novelists and intellectuals who came to attend. And here you can see Richard Wright. 
Also consider the century-long dialogue on race between American and French intellectuals. And we're not just talking about American influence on French intellectuals here. The best example is Franz Fanon. It is not uncommon to hear French intellectuals, both black and white, saying that they discovered Fanon uh, while studying in the United States. Next slide. Uh, I personally discovered Fanon in the United States, along with many French philosophers that are never taught um, uh, back home, among them Foucault, uh, Lyotard, um, all the French theory that is actually not part of the curriculum uh, anywhere in France, and which is deeply ingrained in the culture of American academia here. It is also true that French anti-racism has changed and evolved since the beginning of the century, influenced by the US. Many people, politics, academics, activists have spent time in America and have contributed to rethinking these issues. Many French intellectuals or academics who have made their careers in America are also re-entering the discussion in France. But this is not about, again, Americanizing France. It's about re-entering the country. As a result, a classic history uh, of France tends to neglect race, which is often seen as foreign to our own society or as an American import compared to issues like class, let's say, in the Marxist sense, which has organized the way social sciences and the humanities have looked at inequalities in France um, uh, throughout the 20th century. Um, but a lot of groups uh, have uh, faced that problem in France. Uh, women face similar problems uh, when women's studies, women history, gender historians grew um, in the 1970s and 1980s. Same thing with LGBT studies. There is a tendency um, in France and possibly elsewhere, you know, to explain the rise of new intellectual grounds as an import uh, from the United States. So as I've mentioned before, Macron addressed the French people a day after the first Black Lives Matter demonstration. After the second one, in an interview given to Le Monde, he said he felt that the protesters were comparing American, America's history of slavery and state-sanctioned racism to France's less calamitous uh, racial history. And very quickly, very swiftly, many French intellectuals and politicians followed that discourse. In most mainstream media, uh, left-wing movements like the Black Lives Matter movement were accused of bringing American multicultural multiculturalist politics to France. They became danger to the Republic. And according to many far-right pundits too, the Republic was at risk of cleaving along racial, religious, gender, and sexual orientation lines. To these intellectuals, uh, their philosophy went against the Republican ideals of liberté, égalité, fraternité, liberty, égalité, equality, fraternity. And in a surreal twist of events, they started uh, calling this new movement le wokisme. Uh, next slide. To be honest, there is a long-standing historical pattern in France. Uh, whenever new ideals on gender, race, race, or sexuality emerge, the mainstream media accuse them of being, again, American imports. That happened with the Me Too movement, uh, which was not universally welcome in France. Remember Catherine Deneuve, who defended the right to be uh, hit on uh, in uh, the subway or on the bus or in the streets. Uh, but most of the time, these movements do translate in institutional politics. For example, after the Me Too, the Me Too movement, uh, Emmanuel Macron passed a law criminalizing cat calls. But after the Black Lives Matter demonstration, things change. Let's consider two other events more recent. Next slide. In March 2021, it was revealed that the UNEF, um, France's largest student union, was holding meetings where students of colors were invited students of color were invited to discuss discrimination and racism but these meetings were not open to white people of course there is nothing new here when um, when we see this from an american perspective the history of the feminist movement of the lgbt movement is full of those instances where people of color or people of color organize these types of meetings Melanie Luce, that you see on the picture here, the president of the organization, did explain that people who face discrimination cannot speak freely in front of everyone. The meetings, quote, were intended to put French minorities at ease when discussing discrimination. 
people who face discrimination cannot speak freely in front of everyone. At the UNEF, we are clear that white racism is not the same racism experienced by Jews, Muslim, Arabs, or Blacks. In response to this, Emmanuel Macron voted a new law preventing these types of meetings. Next uh, slide. Take the controversy uh, around inclusive writing, for example, too, or gender neutral pronoun, which again, from our point of view in America is nothing new than under the sun. Uh, based on statistical analysis of a large body of text, the Robert, the Robert, uh, one of the leading dictionary of French uh, language, decided to include just last year, uh, the pronoun, uh, the neutral pronoun, il, uh, in uh, his new edition. Uh, to be frank, uh, I have to be honest, that came as a surprise to me, uh, as I had never seen uh, that pronoun. Um, but the Robert decided that for those who come across uh, this pronoun and want to use it or reject it, they had to define its meaning, uh, which is after all the role of a, of a dictionary. But the French Academy, the Académie Française, the official arbiter of the French language, decided to reject the pronoun. The Academy argued that inclusive writing, quote, undermines the fight for gender equality by saying that in French, neutral, the neutral is supposed to be the masculine. Quote, uh, in a report they say, by advocating an, Im an immediate and comprehensive reform of the spelling, proponents of inclusive writing violate the rhythm uh, of the language. Uh, and Macron also put in his platform, uh, which was just accepted uh, this past Sunday, uh, since he was elected, that inclusive writing will never be taught in any school in France. Next, uh, next slide. In response to these threats to the Republic, the Minister of Education, education uh, Jean-Michel Blanquer, launched a new think tank laborat uh, a new think tank that was called the Laboratory of the Republic. Uh, in October of last year to fight what he calls threats to uh, French Republican values. The goal of the think tank is clear. It will examine how American anti-discrimination ideas have influenced France. Uh, in the article, he further says, this is in no way, this in no way undermines the fight against discrimination and inequality, uh, but we're mobilizing against the excesses the deviances of the movement. And so in order to launch the think tank on January 7th of this year, La Sorbonne, the leading university in France, organized a colloque on wokeism, wokeism or woke culture to denounce uh, anti-discrimination politics in France. Jean-Michel Blanquer claimed in the introduction that he gave there uh, to adopt an intellectually offensive posture against wokeism at a time when, quote, there is an awareness that we must deconstruct deconstruction to invent, to invent new approaches. This is word for word, uh, next slide, the argument of uh, Eric Zemmour's um, in Le Suicide France, Français, the French uh, suicide. Eric Zemmour being, um, uh, was a, a candidate, a far right candidate. Uh, during the last presidential election, who templated very much his uh, campaign on uh, Trump's campaign. Followed presentation by uh, several academics, TV intellectual, who spend hours criticizing postmodernism and deconstruction as something that came from America, as if Foucault, Derrida, Lyota had never existed. So what does this mean for anti-racism? Next slide. In uh, the 2020 demonstrations, activists claimed that the names of slave traders should be removed from statues and public buildings. Uh, are statues being removed? No. The statue, for example, of Jean-Baptiste Colbert, right here, who helped draft uh, the Black Code in the 17th century, which detailed brutal punishment for slaves in French colonies is still standing right in front of the National Assembly in Paris. In his interview in Le Monde, Macron said, quote, we must do historical and memorial work that does not erase who we are, but completes our history. The law still prohibits right now the collection of statistics on race, ethnicity, or religion. 
ensuring that all citizens are treated equally. This leaves the government blind to widespread de facto discrimination against France's Black and Muslim community. Uh, but there is still some improvement, but there's still some improvement though. A recent study by the French Labor Ministry found that job applicants with North African names were 31% less likely to be contacted than those with traditional French names and comparable qualifications. The conclusion of the ministry, hiring discrimination based, presumptive, based on presumptive origins is still prevalent in France, but no actions were taken. Perhaps no other individual uh, better than Elisabeth Moreno, next slide, symbolizes uh, the complicated tensions uh, with regards to anti-racism politics in France. Elisabeth Moreno is a black woman and she's the gender equality and equal opportunity minister. Last month, she was asked on national TV if she thought that there was such a thing as white privilege in France. Um, she rolled her eyes and she said, quote, obviously there is white privilege. The next day, Macron asked her to withdraw the statement and she apologized. In an interview to Le Figaro, um, a right-wing newspaper, she apologized and she said, quote, next slide, I regret using the term white privilege. It locks people of color in the victim's role. And she added, this was too American. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Tristan. I, I obviously have a lot of thoughts and questions and things, but however, I would love to um, see any questions from our part, our participants. Uh, if you want to put a comment or question in the chat box, or if you, I don't, Peter, can they, I don't think they can talk. Can they raise their hand? I think chat we're in. Box usually, yeah. yeah. So if you can put it in the chat box, that'd be fantastic. Um, yeah, so I guess until we get a question in the chat box, Tristan, obviously being a communication scholar, uh, what resonate? Oh, okay, yeah. Peter said, feel free to post questions. Uh, so I guess from a communication response, especially here teaching here in the U.S., um, and we have a lot of international students in our program, and so like I guess, what's your take on her her response? That was probably something that she was asked to do and it probably wasn't something that she wanted to say <laughs> but i'm assuming yeah yeah absolutely you're absolutely you're absolutely <laughs> right and that was um and this is part of the whole discourse right she yeah. was completely misaligned right, right with the general platform and the general uh, discursive atmosphere here mm -hmm. um and so uh, there's no denying that, of course, you know, white privilege does exist yeah, absolutely. Uh, everywhere in the world. <laughs> right. uh, and and but the fact that she was asked to uh, not only uh, compromise on her thinking and mm -hmm. uh, redesign her framework, mm -hmm. uh, but also uh, to compromise, you know, on I think her identity as a black woman who has probably uh, experienced uh, that type of discrimination. Yeah. Um, uh, was very telling on mm -hmm. how far you know the government was um, was really trying to go here, yeah. um, and also you know what's important to me uh, is the fact that they are blaming you know those type of discourses um, on uh, on America. Right. Exactly. Right? I didn't, I didn't so, even know that. Like, and so, I, it's, and I mean, so it's TV, very right. Just yeah, blaming Americans. Prevalent. The French are good at that. And so, yeah. And so that 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 <laughs> that anti-Americanism, you know, which yeah. is extremely prevalent, you know, when it comes to that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in France, is is forceful, mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, and it's also very disturbing in many yeah. ways. And so um, uh, the fact that they are really reframing and 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 theorizing, you know, uh, what's happening as, you know, an import from from the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, is really denying, you know, um, the experiences of many uh, black and brown people in in France. Exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. And and that's I really appreciate. Not only does this talk is this just about the Black Lives Matter movement, but you mentioned so many other social issues too and that's the importance of the committee 
um, that we're both co-chairs yeah. of and this and this speaker series is addressing all these various aspects of DEI. Yeah, you're totally right. And so what, what's important, you know, in France and maybe some some things, you know, a little bit of cultural um, uh, uh, cross-cultural communication here that mm -hmm. didn't come uh, uh, clear during the, the, the presentation is the fact that, of course, uh, we are in a country that doesn't allow a statistics based on race, gender, sexuality or religion. Uh, so the only identity that really um, uh, frames uh, your identity as a national level is citizenship. Uh, mm -hmm. It's either you're French or you're not French. And so mm -hmm. we actually don't have, you know, real data uh, yeah. uh, to 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 say that. So in, in France, uh, uh, questioning, you know, the existence of white privilege or right. of systemic racism, for example, uh, it's something that's very easy because um, you don't have the data, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so uh, even though you know everybody knows that mm -hmm. uh, the the prison system um, is is filled with uh, uh, black and brown people in in France, you know, mm -hmm. up to 60, 70 percent. Mm -hmm. um, because sociologists have done the work and they have gone on site and you know right. see who was there. There's no data, where you know in America we have that type of data, so right. we know right. that there is something going on here. Uh, but it's very easy to it's very easy to dismantle or deny that type of problem in France, mm -hmm. just because well the the statistics are are not here. Yeah, and so yeah. that happens, you know, very much also with other groups huh? that happens right. with, uh, as I mentioned, you know, with uh, with women, with LGBTs, you know, because there's no data, because there's no real scientific way to prove that something is yeah. happening. It's very easy to say, well, those things only happen in America. Right. And you are just importing this problem here. Yeah. It's the same with accessibility as well. And like in... Yeah, it's accessibility is a, it's a little bit different because okay. accessibility is is um, is tracked uh, because okay. there is a welfare system that okay. um, that that helps you know uh, uh, people. So accessibility is um, uh, kind of tracked. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Have any questions from our participants? No question. Oh, not a question. Um, so when I was in Panama in March, I took a Pan-African tour. A lot of what Tristan stated with racism being a quote, American issue seemed to be to echo the people of Panama as well. Yeah, and it, that's, that's a, if I can, you know, say a thing to that. Um, uh, it's definitely not something that's specific to France. Um, I think that this country, uh, the United States, is based on multiculturalism. We are here, we are very much asked to embrace um, multiculturalism. Uh, I mean, we, I mean, as you, for example, you and I love that work, you know, around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so why? Because we love hearing from different perspectives and we want every voices, you know, to be, to feel included. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's very much a model uh, that works very well here, but mm -hmm. that's definitely cultural, right? I mean, it's, it's just other countries don't have that model. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, for example, in France, just like in Panama, I'm guessing, you know, you have this concept of universalism, you know, this mm -hmm. concept of universalism that, you know, the only identity that really matters is that is the national identity. Mm -hmm. okay? Either you're French or you're not French. And the way that you prove that you're French is just that you have a French passport. And mm -hmm. then that's the only identity that matters. You know, mm -hmm. everything else, uh, actually in the constitution, it says that the Republic doesn't recognize any other communities. Can you believe that? I mean, so it doesn't recognize race. It doesn't recognize recognize gender, it doesn't recognize anything else, right? And so it's very much a cultural here um, uh, thing. And, and, and while this country is based, you know, uh, on multiculturalism, this is not really the case for um, other countries. Yeah, we have another what, question from Lisa Jackson. Um, so when did France implement the legislation that forbids collecting data on race? Was there any discussion uh, or rationale why that decision was made? Are there other significant pieces of social identity that are not tracked? So uh, it's um, 
it's not a law that forbids uh or actually it was never decided i mean it's in the constitution so for as far as france was a republic um, we have never allowed to discuss we have never allowed to collect that type of um, uh, data and so the discussion lisa here really is much more about um uh in what areas can we allow this you know and so it's starting to it's starting to to be dismantled uh you know little by little but the general consensus is that it 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 should not be and so here you know just like i'm saying there's no really there's no rational uh the rational is very much cultural uh it's that notion of um universalism uh, that the only the only um, that the only identity that links a nation together uh, is the national identity, right. and so and so there's no reason you know to actually break down you know the national identity into um, uh, other uh, identities, and so just like um, uh, just as uh, Trisha was uh, asking earlier, um, all aspects, all pieces of social identity. Um, or uh, say gender, uh, gender is tracked, yeah, uh, but sexual orientation, you know, disabilities, uh, uh, class is definitely not tracked, you know, race is definitely not tracked. Um, all of those are absolutely, um, uh, absolutely, it's absolutely impossible to, or illegal to, to track those. It's completely, um, it's, it's completely, um, uh, it's it's completely illegal uh, and so which is also the reason why that uh, sometimes you know uh, yeah so it's it's actually illegal yeah it, it, this is might be a little bit off topic but it makes me think about i mean i was in uganda or almost but more important not more importantly but when i think about areas in which we have war based on, based on ethnicity so you don't have the identity card that say you're a hutu or a tutsi so you, mm -hmm. you know again I, i'm always the kind of person like looks at both sides so i yeah, can yeah, see the yeah. benefits of yeah. that as well any other questions Tristan, do you want to share? Um, I know you put in your bio about the current work that you're doing or or any closing thoughts. Yeah, but thank you all for uh, joining here. And so uh, the work that I'm doing right now uh, is work uh, based on those transatlantic uh, conversation on the Black Lives Matter movement. That is the differences and the similitudes, you know, between Black Lives Matter in America and 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 in France. And I cannot wait for you to uh, read all of that. Thank you so much <laughs> for coming. Thank you all. Thank you, Tristan. Thank you.